Welcome back to Megan's channel. Good? Or another one. I am a cool scientist, okay? <laughs> The actual video is going to be 10 minutes long and then the bloopers is going to be 20. So this is how a computational biologist is supposed to look. I usually don't laugh this much when I film. Oh. <laughs> I took one surfing lesson actually in Hawaii once. It did not go well. <laughs> I hope Hollywood agents are watching this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a proud computational biologist, but I am. Wow, world domination here on YouTube. <laughs> this video like five months ago and then we both sort of forgot about it. I'm really happy that we finally made time to make this video. It is my great pleasure to welcome a very fun guest today, Miss Yara, who is a friend and colleague. Whee! I feel like you're such a fun person to work with. Oh, well, you have to come to the Bay Area to really verify that. No, I'm sure you are just as much fun in person as you are through the screen. I disagree. I'm more fun in person. <laughs> Not only are you great in computational work, but humility is your defining quality. <laughs> <laughs> like if you say humility, it's like you're saying, oh, I'm actually, I actually do believe or agree with you that I'm fun on video, which I don't. I'm just saying I'm fun in person and on video it's like, eh. <laughs> Usually I go over the background of whoever I'm chatting with because I think it's really cool to hear the journey of how people got started in whatever they're working on today. And I remember a few months ago, you said something super funny that I referenced you again in one of my videos. And so you were the person who said, I never thought that when I grew up, I would be doing computational chemistry. I didn't say that I never thought I'd be a co computational chemist. I said I never wanted to be. <laughs> Okay, you know when you get out of high school, you're like completely confused, you don't know what you want to do, but you do know some of the things you really don't like. And there were two things I didn't like, at least the way they were taught in school, computers and chemistry. Computers, I thought, was like the system that always broke down no matter what I did. And chemistry was always this thing where it's like, oh, I need to memorize all these things. And actually, it turns out that they're not any of these two things. I actually love what I'm doing right now. So I was wondering, what did you study in your undergrad? I think you mentioned to me before that you were not a bioengineer. So I started out as a mechanical engineer. How did I choose that? It was really by process of elimination. I was like, okay, I like math, I like physics, and I like seeing things in 3D and like actually, you know, getting my hands dirty. So I'm just gonna go with mechanical engineering. And so that's what I did for my undergrad. It was actually a lot of fun. And then I decided I wanted to see how it could be applied in the realm of biology specifically. The long goal being, hey, I want to be involved in developing therapeutics. I decided to go and get a master's in bioengineering, but I never got my master's. <laughs> It was like this program at UCSD where you go in, you do your master's, but basically the first year for MS students is the same as the first year for PhD students. And the requirements are basically the same. You do what you call rotations, which means that you rotate in different labs. You try them out, you see, you feel them out, you see what you like, what you don't like. Maybe you try a combination of like, oh, the culture of the lab and also the actual science that you're doing. And the difference with the master's and PhD program was that in the master's program, you stick with that lab for a year. Um, in the PhD program, it's like, I don't know, it's unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's like four to five years on average beyond that first year. So I did, I went in and I did my rotations and I was at a point um, where just doing classes was not something that I was very excited about anymore. However, the rotations were you just get your hands dirty and you really, really grasp or understand the problem that you're working at on. And so that's what I love the most. So I think it's just gonna transition. <laughs> and then just, you know, stuck, stuck around for a few years. And then I joined the systems biology research group. This is a system, an entity that you wanna study, but you don't wanna study the individual parts. You actually wanna study how the individual parts interact 
in a system. And so in my case, I was looking at bacterial cells and the system that I was the most interested in was metabolism. So I looked at metabolic pathways, how bacteria ate their food, how they processed their food. And one of the questions, the key questions I really was the most curious about was how evolution kind of played a role into shaping the way that these pathways were formed. That was a long answer. <laughs> no, that was perfect. That was perfect. So what I think is sort of funny, it's not funny, but ironic about your journey is that, so you started out with the master's and then left with the PhD. I feel like I hear more of start out with the PhD and then leave with the master's. That's probably the smarter way to go about it. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So let's get into the first scientific question of this video. A majority of our audience will actually probably know the answer to this already, but if you could just explain what is computational biology. Title is both very descriptive and at the same time very vague. So computational biology includes coding and biology. The idea there being that you're really using coding as a tool to solve biological problems. What is the difference between bioinformatics and computational biology? So computational biology is basically an umbrella term and then there's all these other subspecialties underneath. So bioinformatics would be one of it. And when somebody says bioinformatics, I think of DNA, DNA data being processed and then questions that can be answered using DNA data. And bioinformatics is like all the set of approaches that, that are used to process DNA data. And then there are all the, the other subspecialties as well. So systems biology is another one. There's evolutionary genetics where you throw a little bit of statistics in the mix. Wait, that was really good. <laughs> no, it was really good. Um, so, <laughs> Who knew computational biology could be so funny? I tried, I tried, I tried. The analog to the chemistry world would be computational biology to computational chemistry and then bioinformatics to cheminformatics. Yes. What are the parallels between computational biology and computational chemistry? So if I remember well, your video started with the Schrodinger equation as kind of the, the central component for computational chemistry. Yeah. So for computational biology, that central component is actually called the central dogma. That is how we currently understand how genotype becomes a phenotype. Your DNA gets uh, transcribed into mRNA and that gets translated into proteins which fold into enzymes which catalyze different biological processes. Yeah, so I did talk about the Schrodinger equation in my video among with other random sound effects and probably face zooms. <laughs> if there were two things that I I could pick from my biology classes that I remember it's mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and then the central dogma <laughs> like I remember when I was taking chemical biology or some class in college I walked into lecture on the first day there were just three words written on the chalkboard and it was DNA RNA protein <laughs> all the data sets that we have right now all the we call them omics data set that we have right now are really just measurements at different parts of the central dogma. So there's genomics at the DNA level, and then there's transcriptomics or RNA-seq data, where it's like after the gene is transcribed, then you measure the actual um, mRNA. And then there's the proteomics that measures actually the proteins that are being produced. Uh, and then obviously there's metabolomics, where it's like the actual metabolites that are being transformed. It's all about getting all this data together and processing it. I was wondering if you could go over an example problem in comp bio. I'm gonna try one that's like really typical. You're looking at cancer cell lines and you want to find mutations that appear in cancer cell lines. So basically you get DNA data for cancer cell lines and then DNA data for healthy cell lines and then you process that and then you kind of find the parts of the DNA that differ between the two groups. Some of the approaches used are either statistical methods and more recently, or maybe not so recent anymore, machine learning, where it kind of find the mutations that are predictive of the cancer phenotype. Would you mind giving it? <laughs> Would you? <laughs> Whew. Could you give an example of how machine learning can be used to solve a problem within biology? Yeah. Um... <laughs> I tried to make it look natural. I was trying to act natural too. Like I hadn't asked you this question before. Good job. I was good, right? That was re really, really good. Damn. I hope Hollywood agents are watching this. <laughs> you know, you could, you fooled me. I was actually going to answer it normally. 
there was this big advance that happened and it was basically about predicting the 3D protein structure so basically how a protein folds from a one-dimensional sequence so that problem has been around for a really long time I want to say more than a hundred years and it's been really really tough because a one-dimensional sequence can fold in so many different ways and just computing all of that is at least up until today is nearly impossible so you really have to find a way to optimize the way that you look in um, at that space and so DeepMind found that way. They basically took all of the protein structures that we have out there and the, the linked DNA sequences to it and designed this crazy crazy deep learning algorithm or architecture that kind of makes it so that the model within it itself kind of talks with itself and then it makes a prediction at the end of it and the prediction is hey this is how it can fold and it actually works pretty well people are really surprised including myself the first time i heard of this competition that came out where they were actually going to try to solve that problem my reaction was oh that's never gonna happen it's just dreamers you know it's just there's no way it's just too complicated of a problem to solve and yet they've they've achieved it yeah when this news came out this was like the world cup version of the nerd world yeah yeah it really really revolutionized the field of protein engineering structural biology basically it's such a huge step forward i mean people all over are really like focused on actually comprehending what just happened and then also thinking about the futures like how is this going to change what i'm doing today what do i need to stop doing today because i just don't need to do it anymore do you have any advice for those who would like to build a skill set to go into computational biology so any recommended programming languages as well as any other comp bio softwares for sure the baseline is python and r you start with that you need to become really confident and really comfortable it's, it should become like an extra language for you language that you speak every day beyond that it really will depend on what your focus is so for example right now i'm looking into protein engineering methods and so there's like a whole slew of approaches and, and specific packages um, so for my current focus, which is really looking at proteins, I do use Mo, Rosetta, and Pi Rosetta as well. Okay, that was perfect. I know you work with machine learning and deep learning a lot. Do you have any favorite ML library? I use PyTorch. Sometimes there are certain architectures that I'm interested in. They only exist in TensorFlow, but really like just give it a couple months and then they will be translated into all the other languages out there. This field is it's like on steroids. <laughs> it's just, it just never stops. Do you need to be great at CS and then just understand enough biology so that you could understand the context of the problem that you're solving? Or do you think instead people should become very well versed in biology and then practice programming on the side? Ah, uh, this is a tough question actually. Just be great at both. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I know it's hard. I think it's easier to start with computer science and then just go over to biology than to do biology first and then learn computer science. If that transfer is just easier. However, I have noticed that if you just do computer science and really just graze over like the, the really superficial stuff in biology, you will tend to build models that don't perform as well because you don't really understand the data that you're processing. You don't really understand the limitations and errors that your data is going to have. And the only way to do that is actually to know the biology. So what would you say are the career paths of computational biologists? I think at least 95% of the people go into industry just because there aren't that many positions in academia and also because it's just as cool to do research in the industry in some ways it's a lot cooler because you have access to so much more in terms of resources and also people and this is really a question that I've answered for myself very recently so in the industry it's really about putting teams of people together to solve a bigger problem than one person can solve on their own a set of problems that you can really solve in the industry is just bigger. That's cool because in CompBio, you definitely need the computational resources and tools to solve some pretty major problems. Right. In academia though, it's you can dream a little bit more. Really, you can dream about solving problems that will not necessarily lead to profit, right? They will not necessarily lead to this product that you can sell. And that is why academia is still a thing. It's because they know that ultimately it's all part of like this big system of knowledge that you're building towards. I think the coolest part about doing research is that you can't Google the solution. <laughs> if you can Google the solution, you gotta pick a different problem. And that is really cool. 
right? Because you're at a point that nobody has ever been at. You're really at the edge of our knowledge as human beings, right? And you're kind of pushing it. You know, it's just adding one brick. It's a tiny brick, but you added it. And it, it's just, it's a really cool feeling that you're actually the one kind of pushing things a little bit. Well, that concludes the session. Thank you so much, Yara, for taking the time to answer these questions. Well, thank you for taking the time to ask me all these questions. <laughs> Okay, I think that part you really need to cut out. Wait, don't even feel bad about this. Like, you should see me when I'm filming and no one is watching. It's pretty embarrassing. Okay, so I'll start. I'll try to start over. So ask your question again. Maybe it'll come out na more naturally in my mind. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Wait, what was the... Um, okay. <laughs> so now I'm laughing. Um... <laughs> um... <laughs> I should actually save some of that footage. It's just me just like, wait, what am I trying to say again? All right, let's try this again. Uh, uses deep learning um, methods as, okay, I should try this again. <laughs> so this paper came out and it was published by a group at a company called Deep Learning. Um, deep Mind, that's what I meant. That is what I meant.